Radio check, radio check, radio check. This is the Explorer's pod over. Four, three, right. two, one. Hello, good to see you. I'm very, very appreciative. Thanks for doing this. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Uh, yeah, it's awesome to, to meet up. Yeah, man. So first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to you and so many of your accomplishments. You're an absolute savage. Good on you. Um, before. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah, so cool. So cool. We've done a lot of reading, a lot of studying about a lot of things you've done, and very impressive, very inspiring. And we're going to get into that and flesh it all out today. So. Yeah. So. Reino, hello and welcome. Um, thank you again for uh, gracing our show. Yeah, we're very, very excited to meet you and to hear your stories. So for our audience, can you give us a brief background about you and your accomplishment and where did it all start? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm mainly an accountant, um, but most people don't know that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm a I'm a professional accountant, chartered accountant. So that's my that's my adventure during the day with with some business interests that's that's around that. But in the bigger picture, I just try to make life an adventure. I'm in all over the world, different mountains, and got into involved in a in a beautiful sport called adventure racing, which taught me uh, anything from how to go without sleep and navigation and teamwork, and that then eventually led to trail running um, and and. All of that combined over the recent years um, gave me the opportunity to do some running projects across mountains. So that's me in a nutshell. Wow. Yeah, man. So cool. <laughs> uh, one of the things that really, we how we found you was uh, your great Himalayan uh, trail, the, the fast snow and time on the route that you did. And we got pretty stoked on that because Janet and I have for years been dreaming about doing that. You know, we spent, we for the last 10 years, we've gone to the Himalayas. We do some guiding up there on some peak climbing and some adventure treks. And as you may know, Janet did a full traverse of Everest about 12 years ago. <laughs> so we're really, really stoked when we're in the Himalayas. It gives us some solace and some peace and it's a special yeah. place for us. But before we get started, we're probably going to start fleshing out. We want to talk about your adventure racing, but I want to show a quick clip here. So, H? young Himalaya, could you play clip one, please? Adventure racing is for a special breed of person. Someone with an insatiable thirst for adventure. Not afraid to take on the impossible. And someone not afraid to push themselves to the limit of human endurance. Using only a compass, teamwork and a whole lot of courage, teams of four must ride, hike, paddle and navigate their way over hundreds of kilometres, often without any sleep. It's about overcoming fatigue, stress, hunger and sleep deprivation. And if you can keep your sanity, your only reward is finishing a race and knowing you've completed one of the hardest challenges in life. This is not a career for the faint-hearted. This is about testing yourself in one of life's most extreme theatres. Welcome to the Adventure Racing World Championships, staged in the magnificent Shoalhaven region of New South Wales, Australia where 100 of the world's best teams will compete in survival of the fittest Australia. Wow. So the sport of expedition adventure racing or uh, adventure racing as they call it. Janet was a pretty prolific adventure racer here in the Philippines. She was pretty full on for well, something like that though. <laughs> that was super extreme. <laughs> Yeah, well, that sort of she sort of made a name for herself in becoming one of the top competitors here. So she knows a little bit more about adventure racing than I do. I mean, I've heard of quite a few of her stories, and I wish I would have found that sport quite earlier. I was doing triathlons, but then I got involved in sailing around the world and just wasn't into that sort of the competition or just didn't fall into it. But looks like a really savage, cool sport. 
and a good time, but still very painful and takes <laughs> you to a whole new level. What's it like to compete, compete arguably, in one of the world's toughest races? It's just such a beautiful sport. Um, for me, I always say adventure racing, like a lot of the expeditions we do, is, is life condensed. Um, so the easiest way to explain it is, is that you learn more about yourself in a five-day expedition race than I would guess a normal person, if, if we get something like that. A normal person would learn about themselves in five years, purely because you've got everything, communication, um, endurance, learning about yourself, learning to work together, learning to work towards a common goal, um, knowing and understanding that a team can only move as fast as the slowest member at that stage. And mm. there is no space for, for individual egos or, or having your own individual goals. So it's just an absolutely beautiful sport. It's, it's actually got very little to do with the physical aspect. I think that's the bare minimum. It's the the mental approach, but more the communication within a team and chasing that common goal, which which I really enjoy. And you just, I mean, you go through highs, you go through lows, but you never go through it alone. You you you, right. you experience that together as a team. And for when we race at a higher level, I was privileged to race with more or less the same team for about fifteen years. So you wow. really get to know wow. each other very well. And and over the years and in various races, so. It's just a really intense human experience and and you definitely chew it through every race that you do. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so Ugh. that's probably pretty rare, I'm guessing. Most people don't mm. stick together for that amount of time and don't have that sort of camaraderie and uh, ability to sort of work together. So I, I'm guessing you guys have got a lot of advantages out of that. Definitely, and uh, just strong friendships that came out of that. Yeah. Oh wow! I bet some of the coolest, I, best friendships yes, in life. Yeah. The, the, the chemistry and the dynamics of the team is very important, and I think that's very, very hard to to get. You know, to because it's it's a process in the making, and um, so yes, congratulations to that team. Fifteen years. Yeah, that's Amazing. not a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Rhino, can you tell us about your adventure racing experience thus? far to date um tell us about some of your races and the distances as well as your accomplishments so adventure racing uh, per definition is a sport of, of four team members um that must be represented uh by 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 both sexes um, normally our top teams are are one female three males and that has changed over the years as our perception has changed and the ladies has been towing us around uh, the team combinations has just changed and but uh, it's a sport where per definition you've got to move um, on your own accord so no motorized uh, form of transport or, or moving allowed so it's it's a sport where we cycle we run we paddle um, all different kinds of paddling from white water to ocean paddling etc um, a lot of rope work and then depending on where in the world you race you the organizers throw all sorts of other human powered um, activities in there. For instance, if you want to really have a laugh, you put an African team like ourselves in Europe and suddenly we have to do inline skating. Um, I was fairly okay because I come from a, from a bit of an ice hockey background, but generally it, you just get thrown all these challenges of, of, of human powered <laughs> activities. So we've done some sailing, um, we've done rollerblading, we've done triking. Um, and, and that's basically the definition of the sport. And it could be anything from 25 kilometers to 800, 1,000 kilometers. So an adventure race is something very short, two, three hours, all the way to eight plus days. And right. the one is not necessarily easier than the other. Um, mm, yeah. It's the same as saying a 100 meter race for somebody like you're saying, Bolt surely must be easier than a 21 kilometer. And it's not. You, it's a, how you adapt your team dynamics to such a short race or how you adapt your team dynamics to eight plus days, because um, ultimately you want to you want to expand you in the in the best possible way and move the fastest over the course being thrown at you over that distance. Yeah. Um, for me, I've never been very fast, so I really enjoy being during sports, and even today, um, that's why I still do a little bit better in, in longer runs like running across Nepal because um, I don't have a lot of speed, but I've got a good sense of humor and, and, and a bit of endurance, so that, that really helps me. Um, so my favorite race is, is, would possibly be we raced in Patagonia. We raced down um, from Punta Arena south 
uh, the Magellan Strait all the way down to its kind of direction South Pole, which was really, really special as part of the Patagonian expedition race. Um, I really enjoyed that. And then, so that would be sub-temperatures, sub-zero temperatures. And on the other hand, you have a race at Primal Quest, Utah, which you race more than eight days in the Moab Desert. Wow. which is a completely Big different difference. scenario. Yeah. So not only Opposite. do you need to adapt the same team to to different distances, but also just different kind of environments uh, going from sub-zero temperatures or to really 40 degrees right. racing in the desert. But those are the two that really stand out for me. We've raced a lot in Europe, uh, all over the world really, but those two going from the extreme of South America to, to high up North America and the Utah, those were definitely my two most I think enjoyable is, is quite an interesting word to use, but definitely the most meaningful and, and where I've learned most and, and really matured through that race. Wow. Yeah. So you kind of answered my next question, but I'm still going to ask it anyway, because maybe there is a, a definitive here. But uh, currently looking at the world of adventure racing, what is considered the hardest adventure race on the planet? Is it like, for example, I see that there's a few different ones like the Eco Challenge. And then I think what you took place at, uh, part in was the Adventure Racing World Series. But uh, is, there, is, there, is there a format that's harder? Or is there a train that is considered the toughest adventure race on the planet? For example, Fiji compared to Patagonia. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a difficult thing to answer. Yeah. A lot of racing or sport, I guess, is very closely linked to marketing as well. And we all know that any expedition being advertised is, is normally advertised as the toughest race known to man. Right. Um, and there's very there's a lot of toughest races known to men out there. So which one is really the hardest? Um, and no doubt, a lot of these races are extremely tough. But I think it's very individual. It's what your team um, are used to, trained for, prepared for. Um, for instance, I cope a lot better in colder temperatures than I, than I would adjust to tougher temperatures. So mm-hmm. Utah would be a lot harder for me. But if you used to desert races, that would be a lot easier. So definitely the type of, of racing, I would say expedition racing, um, meaning like typically you're five days plus 500, 600 kilometers up. I would, I would guess is the hardest because it's it's easier to manage yourself for 24 hours. Sure. Um, it's yeah. normally three o'clock in the morning on nightfall when the sense of humor is a bit low between team members when real characters are tested. So I would say expedition type racing is, is definitely the hardest in my opinion, um, but there's many tough um, expedition races out there. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I totally get mm-hmm. it. I can see where the, the time would really play a big factor in it but again also your training and what you're trained for is also a huge factor you know if you're living in deserts or you're living in a hot environment like we do <laughs> yes maybe you're way more adapted to the jungle environment and cold might just drop you but i think the one question that th- this leads into another question so sleep de- sleep deprivation for example sleep deprivation can lead to some really crazy moments i personally have had some extreme time sailing alone and I have some stories to go with it, that's for sure. And is, is sleep deprivation, I'm sure, and on the long ones, it's quite common. Did you ever have a time when you began to hallucinate? Do you have any stories that are related to uh, sleep deprivation on the route or the race? Definitely. I made many friends during sleep deprivation. <laughs> never met them again. Um, but yeah, Imagine for sure. <laughs> Honestly, um, I've mentioned earlier that I believe that the toughest challenge of an adventure race is not the physical side, it's the mental side. But if I look at the mental side, the toughest compartment of the mental side is definitely sleep deprivation. In my experience, there is no bigger pain than the pain of just wanting to sleep and you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that's that's really been my experience. Is this it's the it's the toughest pain because physical pain I can personally have experienced that I can still push through, but when your body shuts down, sleep deprivation wise, it just wants to it just wants to sleep, it just wants to shut down. Mm-hmm. And 
I've also, I'll touch on it a little bit, but I've also learned there's many different types of sleep deprivation, like there's, there's literally levels that you start going through. But people say, just use this, just eat this. But the reality is at some stage, your body starts to really want to protect itself um, and, and, and it just shuts down. We, we've, we've fallen asleep during going down rapids in whitewater padding <laughs> or going at high speed over technical terrain, cycling downhill. And people say that's impossible. No, it's very, very possible. It's very possible to cycle 20, 30 kilometers and then kind of wake up not knowing what you did. Um, your eyes were open, but you were definitely not consciously there. So mm-hmm. sleep deprivation, in my experience, is the most painful part of expeditions or expedition racing. And people, people often ask me, can you train for it? Um, uh, I don't, uh, maybe to a small extent, but not really. Yeah, I don't you think can't, so. uh, you, I've, I haven't slept much my whole life. I've always woken up very, very early because I've always had this balance of the academic professional career and expeditions. But even with that, being used to maybe sleeping three to four hours during my school and student years, that never made me accustomed to sleep deprivation. It maybe made me a little bit more used to getting hmm. to, to being uncomfortable not sleeping, but you can't train it. Yeah. Um, so sleep deprivation is, is real and there's different levels. Um, as an example, when I went through Nepal, the one thing I – what I've learned running across Nepal is I've never navigated for that long. So mm, on the yeah. interim, initially, navigating keeps you awake because it keeps your brain going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But after a week, you, that mental fatigue actually takes a sleep deprivation to a whole new level. Yeah. So week one of running continuously, you basically just want to sleep the whole time. After that, you actually semi-asleep the whole time. You don't even realize it anymore. But then later, like towards week three, you don't feel sleepy anymore, but you, you, you just, you're not even aware if you actually wake. You'll have a conversation with Ryan Sands, my running partner and good friend. Yeah. We'll have a conversation and then actually have to double check with each other. Are we actually having this conversation or yeah. am I just imagining? Did it happen? And you're yeah. building all these little tests. Are we actually hearing what we're hearing? You know, so you, you actually get to a space where you don't, the, the, the falling asleep is the easy part because you can have a quick uh, power nap and you feel better. But you go through that where your body just like, okay, I see mm-hmm. you're not going to sleep. Those voices become very real and you go through experiences which you're not quite sure happened. So if you know of, an, of a secret how to get through sleep deprivation, I'm all ears. But for me, I've just learned it. It's just one of those Achilles heels going through expeditions and you've just got to keep yourself as safe as possible through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've gone through some really hard times sailing uh, alone without an engine into some places. One time I sailed into um, the Tomotos and it's uh, a really strange place because it's coral atolls and what happens is you have a, a lagoon on the inside mm-hmm. and you got ocean on the outside and it's just a coral reef that sort of uh, circles the lagoon and what happens is you know, you got movement of wave on the lagoon and you got movement of the ocean, so you really don't see land. And sailing without an inch and navigating into this place, you really have to stay alert. And uh, I remember I, this is when I was just really starting to sail alone and crossing the South Pacific, and I was so scared to fall asleep and like end up on the reef. I actually took. Uh, two alarm clocks and <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> one in each ear and set them for 15 minute intervals <laughs> so I would wake up yeah, that's crazy. and uh, you know I was playing tricks with myself but over the years you know I, I did put myself into some long you know long days three three days sometimes uh, trying to cross shipping lanes and doing things in certain places where I had to stay awake and I had gone through hallucinations and I put myself into some really strange places and in fact I even got on land one time after a trip sat down drank a beer and you know I don't remember people tell me stories but I don't remember any of it and uh, it really was hard on my me mentally I think the sleep deprivation so I totally get it yeah it's hard stuff man <laughs> Well, during your race, uh, Reino, did you ever reach a mental state where you don't feel fear or emotions in the same way as usual? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, have I ever reached a stage where I don't feel fear um, or emotions? No. Does it change during a race? For sure. Um, because of, I would say almost... 
prior proactive agreements with myself mm. where you set the goal, you set the arrangement. I've, I've learned to, to actually go into an event with very specific goals and it's a very specific academic mental agreement with myself to, to keep, keep the emotions aside until you actually reach the finish line because it's expeditions. Wow. That's, that's an interesting way to, to put it, academic um, yeah, to keep connection in, keep in with yourself. In check. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of training and preparation as well as funding in every adventure race. And Janet's told me a few stories about her journey to Everest. And some of the things uh, for her journey was the prep, the, the pre-stuff, the training, the funding, the organizing. And she told me some, some of that stuff was even harder than the climb itself. It took years to, to sort of put it all together. How difficult... You know, you guys were together for 15 years. How difficult is it to get your team to the starting line? It's an interesting question, Janet. I don't know. You, you would have had the question a lot of times. Why do you do it? <laughs> um, it's an interesting question because the preparation is quite hard. Trying to fit in training, professional career, et cetera, et cetera, finding the funding, all the admin arrangements to go to a race. So pre-race is quite tough. During the race is, is obviously, as we've discussed, quite tough. And afterwards, you spend all your time trying to replace all your broken and, and damaged gear. So mm -hmm. the question is, why, why do we do it? This, it's quite a, quite a challenging environment. Um, but for me, those few seconds when you cross the finish line with a few good friends achieving a goal which you initially thought might not be possible, those split seconds crossing the line actually makes it all worth it. So there's no race where the prep during or afterwards is not tough, but we live for those few split seconds that, that you actually realize that you've set a goal and you achieved it and you stuck to your guns and you made it. So um, I would say every event did its own administrative challenges before. And especially if we race in America, the kit list is quite long. It's often very difficult to get the equipment that we need for that specific race. It's not always available in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But th there's never been a race where you can look afterwards and say this and it wasn't worth it. Um, and I think that that's what makes the sport extra tough. It's not just a race. It's it's designing your whole lifestyle around making this possible. And, and often also that puts strain on relationships, on work environments, and it's really, if you learn how to balance all of that, then, then that's also a, a really good skill that you transfer back into life and, and makes us ultimately better at everything else we do. Wow. Very well said, Reino. Um, I agree. You know, uh, the race doesn't start in the starting line. It starts with how you train and get together as a team, how you train every day and the chemistry and bonding and how you go through the hurdles before you even get to the starting line, you know. And uh, Todd uh, said something about, like, in the Everest, it's mostly um, the fundings and, and the preparation is, is, very, is very challenging, uh, is more challenging than the climb itself sometimes. Yes, because, you know, when, the, uh, when it's time to climb, when it's time to race, everything's set already, you know. But putting it all together, it's just like blood, sweat, and tears. So I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> So knowing yourself as well as your teammates, I assume sure. it's essential and all situations are different for sure. But what do you do when you find one of your teammates in their darkest hour? I think there's actually a little bit of a, maybe even a, a few steps before that question is if you race that often together, you notice that a team member is in a dark space before they notice right. it. Yeah. You can see it in their eyes, their body, their whole movement. Because everything. it's such a mental game. This, the visuals are so focused on getting through a dark spot. But my team members can see when I'm taking more strain than I should before I actually realize it because I'm so focused on not letting them down, not slowing down, etc. cetera. Um, so we actually notice each other when we go through, through dark spots and – it is just acknowledging it because especially when you're a young racer and you start in the sport, your biggest fear is that people see that you suffer. Mm. But the more you actually go through this 
sport, you more realize that for help as quick as possible. And there's the basics of just emotional support. But the other, the, the reality is, is you take each other's backpacks, weight. Um, we've had paddle leagues where one person would just sit in the boat and the other one would do all the paddling, um, as an example. So it is, it is really just taking as much weight, emotional and physical weight, off that person when they go through the dark patch because yeah. we all know if you do this long enough, tomorrow's my chance. Right. So there's a massive shift when you start racing competitively and been doing it long enough is that it's better for the team to acknowledge it as quick as possible because even if you think you can hide it, your team members know you're suffering. The quicker we acknowledge it, the no ego in the team members. We know we're always as a team in the red, racing as hard as we can and then carrying each other's weight. And not, that's not just different times in the race. It's also if you race all these different disciplines, one team member would be more competent in cycling. The other one would be more competent on foot or paddling. So we also naturally know who's taking more, more weight in which disciplines. But even with that, during those disciplines, we'll notice that somebody is taking strain. And the trick is to lift that weight before the person goes behind the point of recovery. Um, if you literally, if you do expedition racing, you can you can suffer three to six hours and recover and be stronger than you were. So it's just to be aware, firstly, individually, but also be reminded by your team members, this is just temporary, let's lift the weight, let's not make it any bigger than it should be, and let's keep moving. Because the one thing in adventure racing you can't afford to do is to stop. You never, never stop. Even in an expedition race, the only time you'll stop is for a quick sleep. But everything else is moving. So even if somebody takes strain, we can move slower, but we'll never stop. And it's just to manage that balance in the team. Wow. Wow. It just really brings a lot of memories in you know, adventure racing. There's a lot of things that are here in my head that, you know, it's, it's very true what you said. Um, let's go to your gear. What was your favorite piece of gear and or clothing or food? Uh, do you have any recommendations? You know, it's like you have any secret <laughs> for for power? Secret weapons. <laughs> secret weapons. <laughs> I, I often get asked about my very special diet, and I have to be honest. That's the one area that I've that I've never focused on, um, and that I'm terrible at. I just love eating sweets and chocolates when I race. I do believe the best nutrition is what you enjoy eating. Uh, because if you're just going to, like in a race, in that kind of where you burn that amount of calories and you just need to feel the machine the whole time, the best thing you can eat is what you enjoy eating because you use it as a bit of a, a main incentive as well. If I just get through the next 10Ks, I can have a bite of chocolate. If I can just get to that point, I can reward myself like this because you're always pushing in the red. So in terms of nutrition or my favorite food, I'm possibly the worst person to ask. Um, I really just enjoy um, or, or I really advise um, people starting racing to, to make sure you pack enough aspects that you enjoy, pack enough food that you enjoy eating. In terms of gear, I would definitely say that a good waterproof jacket can get you through, like a shell jacket can get you through most situations. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's that's one aspect. If you go into the mountains, if you go into jungle areas, if you have a good waterproof shell, you can use it for shelter. You can obviously wear and keep moving it, um, especially considering how much energy you lose when, you, when you're really cold and it's windy. So a waterproof shell jacket keeps the wind off, keeps you dry, and you can actually move through most conditions with a good waterproof shell jacket. Nice. Yeah. So comfort food i totally get it you know that was one of the things janet told me too while she was climbing everest that uh she really just stuck to comfort food you know her local base sort of stuff you know they eat rice here but uh on the mountain (laughs) they eat a lot of rice here but uh she she did some sort of rice sugar mixes that really kept her going on the mountain and has always told me comfort food is the way to go so I believe it and I get it. So I think that's great advice for everyone. Um, One of my questions here is, what worked well for you and your team? Uh, What have you learned over time that helps lead to success? Is there something that you can sort of, do you have a takeaway? 
I think the most important lesson I've learned in sport, whether it's in work, whether it's in life in general, is communication is, is the key factor for success. And often we understand that incorrectly because the, the most important narrative you'll ever have is with yourself. So even in a race where you race with three other people, the most important conversation you'll have is with yourself the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy to talk and motivate other people, but we tend to break ourselves down. Um, you mentioned sailing around the world on your own, and the amount of conversation you have in your head there is 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 insane. And yeah. but you can control the level of that narrative. Um, like open and honest conversation with yourself, I believe, is the key factor to success which means that when you're hurting, acknowledge that you're hurting and then make a plan how you're going to approach it mm-hmm. instead of saying, I should have been better, etc." So I think obviously in a team sport, like a bench racing, communication between team members, hey, I'm taking strain or where are we going? What is the map saying? But as I get older, the one thing I've learned is whether it's expedition, whether it's work, it is how do we communicate with ourselves? How honest are we with ourselves, but also do we have grace with ourselves? You go up a mountain, three quarters up, you're taking strain. You've got one or two choices. Either acknowledge it and then have a conversation with yourself. How do you best address it and get to the top? Or you can get three quarters up and start blaming yourself for not training enough or whatever the reason might be. And then basically you've lost, you've lost that, that, that battle. So one key factor is communication, but start with that narrative with yourself. And I know it sounds very eerie fairy, but the reality is I'm very good at breaking myself down. I don't even need somebody else to be critical, like critical towards me. But if I do that three o'clock in the morning, when I'm already sleep deprived, there's no way I'm going to get through the night, but I can't change the whole situation. People say you, th- you should think positive. You can't think positive if you don't actually speak to yourself positive. And, and how we speak to ourselves, I think, is, is getting through those dark patches in the expedition or, I just guess, in, in day-to-day life. Wow. Well said. Thank you very much. It's uh, a lot of great uh, life lessons and wonderful insights I feel I'm getting here in quite a quick yes. amount of time. So, <laughs> well said. Looking back on all your races... Do you have a moment that you suffered the most? What was it? And was there a way, when you're looking back, is there a way you could have changed that situation? Um, sure. The mind is awesome because you forget those moments. Uh, <laughs> you, you tend to just remember the best ones. I think yeah. the most recent would be the, the, the Nepal. Um, if we did remember those moments, I guess we'll only do one or two expeditions. Yeah, yeah. We're not going back. So the mind's phenomenal. I don't really have, yeah, yeah. I don't really have bad memories. I think the most recent challenges were obviously running across Nepal, where, mm-hmm. where I was or had to make the decision to expose my hands, got frostbite that, that led yeah. to a really bad spiral. So that was definitely from a from an expedition point of view, where I really really suffered was was running across Nepal and and just managing those demons after after I got frostbite. Yes, um, well, we could just imagine, you know, it's oh, like I saw the videos. <laughs> hey, 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 I saw the film. Out, it didn't yes. look good. Wow. Yeah. Are you are you still into adventure racing, right now? If if so, what's the next big race? What's what's keeping you busy? Um, so I'm not actively doing adventure racing at the moment. I actually had a look at one or two races coming up early next year today, and then you just try to to think of something else for a little bit to to hopefully it goes away. Um, because <laughs> the reality is, once you do one race, you race competitively again for two three years. Can't stop. Um, and it's always a joke in adventure racing. You, you from a professional or from a from a from a high level adventure racing career we, we we often retire and then you just take a year or two off and then you do one race and you're back for two three years before you before you pull out currently i'm i'm quite committed on a business side as well i've, I've got a big passion and drive to invest in people through business so, so that, that keeps me quite busy on a global scale and and the problem is because I've raced adventure racing at quite a high level, if you do adventure racing, you want to do it at that level and that takes quite a bit of time. So what I do do is I substitute that more with solo or small team projects for, for brands like Red Bull where we, we run across mountains, etc., which gives me the opportunity to do 
the expeditions, the sleep deprivation, the navigation, but maybe with a little bit less. Um, so that, that's, that's more my version of adventure chasing at the moment is either solo or just with one friend like Ryan Sands and when you – I can hear okay. you guys again. Yeah, we lost you there for a bit. We're having, we had a typhoon yeah. right now a few weeks ago, and it was a pretty big one. And we've had difficulties with our signal since then, and no one seems to yeah. know why. But I presume it had to do something with, with the, the typhoon. And, with the tower or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so, but we are going to make the best of it. We got most of what you said there. It's interesting to hear about uh, your business endeavors and where you're putting your energy at today. We'd probably like to hear a little bit more about that in the end. We'll, we'll bring it up again. But I want to sort of move forward here. You have quite a few mountaineering speed records that are quite extraordinary. And uh, I want to play a real qu quick clip here for our audience. Uh, can you pull up clip two? It's not going to be easy out there, but... It's the end result is going to be worth it. I reckon I'm going to be questioning my sanity at least a dozen times over the next 40, 50, 60 hours. The Drakensberg Grand Traverse is a 210 kilometer traverse crossing the, the Drakensberg Mountains from north to south. The current record is 60 hours, so we're going to be starting at 12 o'clock at night and going through that night, going through the whole day and then the, the, the following night and hopefully kind of finishing early evening. Some of the, the key rules of the traverse is that it's got to be entirely self-supported. So we've got to carry everything we need. You can have no outside assistance. We stop. So the, I just showed a, a clip, and I'm probably yeah. going to pronounce this wrong. Can you help me with this? How do you say that uh, the, the, the Drakensberg, Drakensberg Traverse? That's correct, yes. Um, so Drakensberg is basically, direct translated is Dragon Mountains. So it's just because of the shape and the and the and the and the jaggedness of the mountains. We've we've got a uh, it's our major mountain range in South Africa, Drakensberg. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that that Drakensberg traverse, uh, you did it in forty one hours forty nine minutes, and which is interesting Correct. because the previous record was sixty hours twenty nine minutes, and you you absolutely shattered it. Like, oh my god. Uh, congratulations again. And uh, this was your record, correct? Thank you. So you shattered your own record. It was correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> My, I, it's amazing I'm, just how your your frame of reference changes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm curious. Has anybody come back to uh, to uh, try and break your record since then, or even come close? There, there has been some attempts, uh, but uh, the record still stands, yes. Um, it's, it's quite a commitment to, to, to tackle that record, but there, there has been some attempts, but currently it still stands. What, what, why? What, I, I look, it looks incredibly hard, and we really mm. want to talk. I want you to sort of tell us about the train as well and what makes that so difficult. Uh, we're so far away, and it's something I don't know too much about, but uh, what really makes it so difficult for others to sort of... Uh, you know, chip away or, or even break your record. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, it's just very remote, firstly. Um, so if something goes wrong, there's a big risk. And to move fast over those mountains, you've got to go light. But if you go light and something goes wrong, nobody's going to come and rescue there. Chances are very slow, uh, small um, of a rescue. And there are no trails. It's just all to, like it's completely off the range. Just long grass, big boulders, so it's very slow moving. Um, so it's, it's quite a commitment and it's quite a mental game because every second step you're going to stumble over some rock or step in some hole. It's not it's not comparable to like European mountains or any well-traversed mountains. It's um, they, are, they are one or two tracks, but they go in completely other directions. So you're pretty much running off trail with – with quite a high altitude, about 3,000 meters above sea level. Wow. 
um, just slow moving. Um, I guess like with many other expeditions, you've just got to be able to, one, have a good sense of humor and then just kind of relentless forward motion. The ability to maintain a certain pace just um, over, over that kind of terrain is, is quite, a, quite a mental challenge. Yeah, I've seen some of the terrain. I saw some of the areas that you were sliding down, and that was one of the things I immediately thought was uh, the risk of, you know, turning or breaking an ankle in that area definitely looks like uh, could be a real hardship. Yeah. Uh, One thing I was curious about is how, I mean, you and Ryan are fellow countrymen. Did you race together? How did you guys find each other? How did you guys end up really pairing up? So Ryan is a Ryan is an international trail running legend. I yeah. followed him um, just as a fan, uh, mm-hmm. um, and and followed his career. Um, I was kind of towards the end of my trail running career, if you can call it that way, um, when Ryan came onto the scene, and I, I literally just followed him. Super inspired, still till today. He's just my role model. Uh, I absolutely love what he does, how he does it. And um, there was a race in South Africa where um, we, he won the race. I ended up being third in the specific race, and we just got chatting afterwards. And we just he knew that I, I spent quite a bit of time at the Jakersburg. And the initial suggestion came that if to take on this record, I will help him prepare. I will take him on the mountain, show him around, and just really some skills and give him. Um, and that was really how it started, but. Then we started doing some pre, pre-recorded pre attempts or, or recce's um, on the mountain. And we actually gelled very well. We, we moved very similarly on that terrain, although I could never run like Ryan. But I had a bit of navigation background and, and a bit more other endurance background. And, and we actually just complemented each other very well. Hmm. And just spending time preparing for this mountain journey, we actually became really good friends. And Ryan asked, "Don't I write, would I rather want to join him? Uh, taking on this record as opposed to me just being part of his backup team. And, of course, I said yes. Um, just the, the, the option and the, and, and, the, and the opportunity to run with him is, is phenomenal. And sure. that's really how we did the Jakersburg together. But since then, we actually became really good friends. And we do a lot of not just running and expeditions together, but also run a business together, et cetera. So it's just been a really cool story where I got to befriend a, a role model and we just became friends. That's great to hear. Yeah. You know, he, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of the stuff where you guys are together. He seems like a really wonderful person, a beautiful soul. And you guys have a great friendship. You can see it. It sort of shines through in everything that you guys do when you're talking together. So it looks like a real cool partnership. Good on you. Thank you, you so have, much. You have set the... Uh, you have set the record twice now. What has kept bringing yes. you back? Is it because it is close to home or is it something else? It's just, I love mountains. I've always loved mountains and it's the biggest mountains we have in South Africa. So I've also used that to train for other international mountains. It's about five and a half hours drive from home. So it is a bit of a commitment um, to go over a weekend. But I've just, as a student and, and, and in my young professional career, I've just made time to, to really go there often. And it's just super beautiful. Um, I just love the ruggedness of the mountain. I love suffering in the mountains. I love learning about myself in the mountains. And I've actually, before I did it with Ryan, I've just spent a lot of time alone in, in the Drakensberg. Um, it is quite committing. Um, and because of that, because of the commitment factor, and I used it actually as training for adventure racing, um, I just learned a lot about myself and then there's this connection of almost reconnecting with myself, reconnecting to previous years that, and, and lessons that I've learned that um, that's just really also always drawn, drawn me back. I guess you can call it a bit of a spiritual journey going back there um, because there's, there's some of the best and some of the hardest times I've ever had were, were in the Drakensberg Mountains. And... Um, to, to find the best route to traverse the mountains takes many years. You can't just right. you, you can't just pitch up. Um, it will be dangerous and, and you, you will be slow. So 
I've spent about 10 years on, on that traverse, um, mm-hmm. fine tuning um, the route right. uh, before I attempted. I actually did it twice on my own before um, I then did it with Ryan. So I knew the route pretty well. Mm-hmm. And because of rain and weather and seasons, actually it changes. So you also can't bargain on three years ago's information. So, and after Ryan, I actually did it with a very good friend of mine in a mixed record as well so i was really i was really keen for suffering those years and i just went back and did the traverse a couple of times actually but yeah you know, just special memories and and learned a lot about myself wow great so I, that's, I, that that is really a uh, a proof that there's no shortcut you really have to work hard and you really have to practice and it takes a lot of effort to you know focus in one thing that's it's really good i think we all have something in common we all love the mountains here it is yes, a real special do. place and it's a place where again i get my suffering but i still get my solace <laughs> and uh yeah very cool it also bring it brings me to my next question i've been quite, quite curious about uh your south african nine peak record and I I didn't really understand how that was done, and my my question was, I there's a, I presume there's a car involved, and how does the car work, and is the is the factor is the time of the car factor is does that factor in? Do you have to drive fast? <laughs> What's up with that route? Tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> I have to be honest. When when I was approached to do to challenge that record, I wasn't interested at all. Um, purely because of the the vehicle involvement. Okay. Uh, being a purist, being all about outdoors, it's like why would you why would you yeah. do that? And we, I ended up doing it because two friends asked me. And it was it was one of the most fun missions or records that I've ever done. Cool. Um, not because of the drive. because you see your whole country in two days right. so the record the record basically these nine peaks you can do them in any order you can start at any one of them mm. and they're scattered around south africa because it's the highest it's not the nine highest peaks it's the highest peak in each of our nine provinces right right i read that so yeah. you can start at any of the mountains you summit the first mountain, you drive to the next one and summit. But the clock starts when you when you start running and it finishes right at the end, including the driving time. Oh. But because of live tracking, you obviously you you you're being kept to 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 driving the speed limit, etc. Okay, et so there's some rules um, on so that you've speed got to limit. Find, there's some really, really <laughs> tight rules on the on the speed limit, Good. but also it actually forces you to not just take the main road. You end up driving all these little back roads in your own country, which without this trip, you would never have seen. Right. Okay. Um, and then also because of the event, you, because we competitive, we had all these own little rules for ourselves. We never, never allowed to stop. So that basically meant that we actually packed all our food in the car. We never stopped for a toilet break driving. So any toilet breaks are confined to when you actually – getting out to climb the mountain. So sorry to hear if you've got any challenges in between, you, you're in the car and that's just how it is. So you've got to really time all of this well. You've got to change drivers. Um, you get dressed and undressed in the car. You eat in the car. So you actually spend 40-odd hours with two of your best friends in a car. And it's <laughs> it's almost more like an amazing race. I wouldn't say yeah, it's like it an expedition like per se. It was just a super fun way of seeing your country. But it also, there's a lot of families um, and a lot of people that do that over a week or so, and maybe not even all the peaks, but it's it's just something really fun to get people um, to see the country and, and at least summit some of the, the mountains that they're comfortable with in, in their group. <laughs> so wow. it's a, do we have, is this something people are trying to uh, to do every year is – you know, I can imagine or it's got only... one because it's it's fun. I like the activity the way it's sort of done. Uh, are people trying to break your record <laughs> quite often? Um, yeah, again, lucky that it still stands. Um, we, we went pretty hard when we did it. <laughs> um, but there are people that's doing it in all sorts of different ways. Okay. Um, and I think that's really cool. It's just anything that gets people outside. And I think obviously... Yeah. Um, with this year, with with having all the COVID challenges, etc., people just had time to one get to know themselves, 
appreciate the outdoors when they actually get outdoors. So a lot of these kind of challenges resurface in a much bigger way post-COVID where people just take their families out where traditionally they would go away and stay in a hotel for a weekend. Now they see the country. South Africa is super beautiful. And we've got all these little challenges that there's get people people outside. Yeah, obviously, when we did it, we be pretty competitive, so you see how fast you can do it, but it's not always about the pace. It's just really experiencing the yeah, mountains. Yeah, the experience. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm just thinking right now, do you know, uh, it's, it's another, we had one of your fellow countrymen on uh, a few weeks ago. His name is uh, Rion Manser. Have you heard of Rion before? He's an absolute legend in our country. Um, brilliant storyteller. Um, love both him and Fasti. Um, I had a look on your website, so I saw you guys had a chat to him. But again, just somebody that lives adventure and and inspires people to get outside. So I've been privileged to to be at some talks where we both were, were hosting talks at different events, so and, cool. and I've been privileged to hear quite a bit of bit of his stories, read his book, um, and just such a legend and, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. inspiring person. Yeah. Totally. So, a great book. I read his book as well, and I thought there was a lot of <laughs> and spiritual his insight. His stories as well is like he's, mind blowing. <laughs> he's a great storyteller, a beautiful, beautiful voice for Africa. That's one of the things I really appreciate, appreciate about Rian is uh, his real positive voice about Africa as a whole. He's got something there, sure. and I really enjoy it. So. But I, I'm just thinking that he'd probably be into doing some crazy, fun story right now. Something about South Africans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So really, yeah, really. it was really nice having him. We met, we met Rian uh, about a year ago in Vasti. Sorry. Yeah, we met them both in Dubai at this called the uh, Travelers Fest uh, Dubai. And we sort of had to build our friendship there. Yeah. But it was nice to see them again. But anyway... <laughs> Just want to touch base on them, your fellow. Your that's fellow. good to know that you're, you're you, you know him and <laughs> yeah. you're yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so uh, they are they are they are such great ambassadors for, for totally. getting outdoors and doing whatever in your realm. Um, and I just haven't made a better storyteller in my life. He's just he's just he's phenomenal. great. He's great in, in explaining what they went, especially when they paddled um, him and Fasty as part of their honeymoon. <laughs> It's just oh. like listening to those stories is just crazy. What a honeymoon, man. And, and, and he really has a, a great love for humanity. He's a special soul, yeah. this guy. I really dig it. <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, this sort of brings us into the part that, that, that brought us to you, and we want to talk about... Uh, uh, the, the Great the Himalayan, Himalayan Trail. Trail, yes. Janet and I have been looking at it for years now, and we're going to do it a couple of years ago, and something stopped us, and we just couldn't make it. But um, I want to pull up a quick clip just to introduce our audience. Let's pull that up, young Himalaya. Thank you. What happened? Reina, you okay? Are you... Prepared to go up and do all these things and die. Yeah, pretty much. There definitely was a certain element of, of fear, like knowing that I'd never been into mountains that big before. There was just an appeal to it's the fastest crossing of the pole. We're looking at 1,500 k's across the country, 70,000 meters up, 70,000 meters down. So. It's gonna be epic. All the nervous. Start. If you don't plan a project where there's enough risk of stuff going wrong, then you're way too much of a safe comfort zone. I want to see how far I can push something. Our goal was to move as fast and light as, as possible without taking too many risks. But moving fast and light, you're always going to take some kind of risk and we didn't have sleeping bags or a tent. We're trying to see where, where Ryan and Raina are. Wow. Okay. As I said, that's been a dream trip for Janet and I. Obviously, we're going to take it a hell of a lot slower. <laughs> <laughs> but 
so cool to talk with you and get some real life beta. So it'll make it a heck of a lot easier when we do do it. A lot it. of advice, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did you decide on the Great Himalayan Trail? Can you give us a bit of a background on uh, what you and Ryan's were? and Ryan were actually attempting. So firstly, how did we decide? I think there's a there's a saying in mountaineering to never stare at a big mountain too long, <laughs> meaning never never talk about something too long because it will eventually happen. And Ryan and I just spent a lot of time in the Drakensberg and, and on other runs. And, and when you run, you obviously have the whole day to talk. And it's like, hey, this would be a cool idea. And then you forget about it. And then we just spoke about Nepal. I've got a, a big love for Nepal and I've climbed there quite a bit over the years since, since school days. And it's just like, hey, let's let's have a look at a run across Nepal. And the, a fellow South African actually set the record, um, the FKT running across Nepal um, on the Great Himalaya Trail. And we said, well, let's have a look at that. And it, it also just happened that this fellow South African held the, um, it's Andrew Porter and held the joggers book or I improved on it um, with 60 hours. So there was a little bit of healthy rivalry. If we're going to run across Nepal, let's let's have a look at Andrew's record. And um, that basically gave us a, a framework to take this on. And kind of, yeah, just, I think you just talk about something to a point where it's like, there's no use talking about it. Let's just go and do it. So what we tried to do is just, um, Andrew Porter set a record of 28 and a half days running from basically the west of Nepal, um, from a little village called Hilsa, all the way across the country on the Great Himalaya Trail, finishing at a village, uh, Pashupatinagar. And he he basically then followed a very specific route because to put it in context, there's no single Great Himalaya Trail. And that leads to a lot yeah. of discussions and politics because what exactly is the FKT and um, yeah, yeah. They are generally a high route and a low route, um, but what we what we decided is to to take on the route that that, that Andrew took mm-hmm. um, to give us a good frame of reference. But even in that, Andrew never gave us his route because that would wait be no, way too easy. Want to make so it I easy met up with yeah. Andrew and said, <laughs> "Listen, sure, you've got to do you've got to pay the school fees and and do the homework." Mm-hmm. And, and I truly believe in that as well. So he gave me 11 marks across Nepal. If we tick those checkpoints, then it would be regarded as a fair challenge to his, his record. Sure. So basically I had this massive map, 11 checkpoints, and then I had to start connecting dots um, and see how we would kind of approach connecting this. Cool. I've got you guys back. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were just, I think the last thing that you said was you, connecting were, you were connecting the dots. Yeah. Can you move forward from there? Yeah, I think uh, basically the, 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 the biggest part of the challenge, or at least the first phase of the challenge, is to to start on the western side. We're at a very like identifiable point, Hilsa, have to get to Pashupatinagar, which is the identified finishing point, and you've got 11 checkpoints. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, the first phase of the preparation starts is how do you connect these dots, um, which I really enjoyed because that's very similar to adventure racing, but... Um, I personally spent about 400 hours on those maps. And if you know Nepal, you know there's actually not very good maps available yeah. for Nepal. Um, so it's just a combination of Google Earth and the best topo maps you can find, electronic and physical, and then also hiking maps. But hiking maps for that area is 150,000 scales, so yeah. that doesn't help you too much. And then that's just the journey started in how to, to try to connect those dots before we, before we actually left from South Africa to go to Nepal. Wow. Yeah. So, so I, I yeah, I, that's definitely a huge challenge. Yeah, just it's the logistics. Huge. So the Great Himalayan Trail, as Todd has mentioned a couple of times, we have contemplated in doing it a few times now. You should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's really in bucket list. But how long did it take logistically for you to prepare for it? And how did you figure out the the coordinates and yeah how did you do the route the the, I don't, you don't have to give it all away because i know you yeah <laughs> you don't give it all away but that was one of the things that sort of was a huge conundrum for us because we yeah. were like wow it was uh daunting to sort of look at the the route the charts how to figure it out i know that because we've tracked through you know portion of that trail but even there 
uh, it's it's difficult. I mean, it's yeah. hard to follow the route even when you're when you're walking. It's it's quite difficult to explain to somebody, especially if you come from Europe. There there are trails and there are well marked trails. Um, if you go to Nepal, there are many trails. Um, which, but the reality, it's it's not marked in in the sense that we often used to in mountains. Um, and all you really have is is, is major land uh, landmarks in the sense of villages or mountain passes. And, and then you've got to really look at the map, um, and the maps don't have a lot of detail, about 400 hours on those maps, which is really, you start with Google Maps. You start with Google Earth, and you just zoom into a specific area, and you look at the valleys and, and, and decide, uh, you know, what, what kind of a approach you're going to take. And wow. I guess for the good and the bad, the valleys are so big that you're either in a valley or not. So it's not like you can really get lost. The thing is just if you're in the wrong valley, you can waste two, three days because it might not yeah. go in the optimal direction or you are not. You can't just jump the ridge and jump into another valley. <laughs> yeah. So you want to ideally know which valleys to take beforehand. So um, I really just started with plotting because I didn't have coordinates. I just had names of villages. So you start like with normal Google and, and Google these names and just hopefully it's the right it's kind of the right village you're looking at because apart from the yeah, getting names of villages or mountain passes from Andrew, I had nothing else. Yes. Um, so start with Google Earth. Um, I found an electronic version of topographical maps of Nepal, um, which then really helped. And, and I started to route all these different options together, often literally just printing out a portion of the map and standing above it just to have a little bit of a, a bigger perspective. It's like, this, does this make sense? And this kind of continued for about six months, um, and I still made minor changes just before we flew out. And even getting there, you realize what you thought you're looking at and what it looks like on the ground is very, very different. With adventure racing, you learn to interpret as opposed to just following lines. So uh, even the lines that I did draw, draw in beforehand is, is really just what we call handrails. It's, it's predominantly just keeping you in, in, in an honest and right direction. But you've got to be able to make those more on the ground micro navigational decisions on a daily basis. And that brings me back to the steep deprivation discussion we had at the beginning, because that's easy in week one, a lot more difficult in week three to make those micro decisions and calculations based on, it's not just going in the right direction, but you want to hopefully finish more or less close to a village um, two o'clock in the morning or whatever to be able to get out of certain weather conditions. So it's not just the direction you go, You've got to keep an eye on the weather. Where do you think you can be more or less in 10 hours' time? And often we got caught out with, with the temperatures and the weather, and we actually got into some really life-threatening situations yeah, where we didn't that. move as fast as we thought we move, and you find yourself in the middle of nowhere um, in, in some really bad weather conditions. So, yes, so, so you said that you, o- you only had a f- start and a finish and 11... Um, Tick boxes. Check That's all points, you have, right? Points, yeah. So, how did you go about the Correct. permits? And did you use a local agency to sort of like, you know, establish communication ahead of time? Definitely, I, I have a I have a phenomenal um, contact, and and which then became French uh, friends in, in Himalaya, uh, a company called Himalayan Trails. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, became very good French friends with with uh, um, with Raj over there. He was mm-hmm. my friend and man on the ground, and right. behind him, um, uh, quite a team in 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 helping us with logistics because permits in Nepal crossing a whole country is is a, is a oh, challenge. Oh man, yeah, yeah. I mean, just in one province Bit complicated, is yeah. difficult. <laughs> So we can ask those permits. Yeah. A lot of the permits, you can only get three or four days before you enter into mm. a certain area. Yeah. Oh. So it's not like I can sit in South Africa and say, I want permits for all these areas. You can only organize it while on the move and we're out of communication you don't in know. the high mountains. And I've got Raj and his team that's supposed to, that, 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 that's tasked with getting these permits and getting the physical paper to us. Wow. wow. <laughs> you you, you <laughs> can't just get them to send you a screenshot on your phone. Definitely need a lot of credit here. Himalayan <laughs> Trails. Is that the name of them? Raj and Himalayan Trails. They're definitely a lot of great support. For there. sure. 
Correct. Yes. So they're they're yes. also they're also um, yes. working with you on your time. Continually. You know? always, yes. Yeah. Like Without you know, you're beating a record and you're setting a record, so they have to be on time as well. So so not. They might have a new <laughs> record as well. Yeah. That's great. Sorry, just as part of the, the preparation, it's not just working out the route. It is breaking that route of 1,500 Ks, breaking it down in best time estimates, where you're going to be more or less. Um, and then you've got to take into account the elevation gain for the day, the type of terrain you're going to cross. And without having a, a, a proper visual of what you're going to face, you've got to work out the best possible time estimates to make the to make the uh, limit allocation as easy as possible. So it is the, the amount of spreadsheets I've built going into this project is insane. But then you get there and you get told that the winter is a month late and then everything goes out the window. Because you some days you only cover 30 kilometers in a 24-hour cycle because you're waist deep in the snow. So all that prep just went out the window and you had to make decisions on the ground. So that's just our kind of part of the adventure. But yeah. all those spreadsheets pretty much meant nothing the moment we hit the ground. And then just the logistic of trying to get to backup gear and kit, um, that's, that's a whole story on its own. What a yeah. story. I, we, we, we've been through the hassles of the paperwork there, so <laughs> we can't imagine what you had to go through. Yes. So congratulations on that. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. Yeah. So, you know, we've always seen that you have uh, been quite clear about what you were attempting and how you were using Andrews as a base uh, to work with. And we totally get it and we understand it. And we do see that political side out there and, you know, it's all part of the game. So, uh, but I was curious about the Lizzie Hawker route. So Lizzie, she did the, the high route without technical climbing requirements. Uh, pretty impressive. I think last time she did it in 35 days. Do you know much about that route? I do know quite a bit of the route. Um, it is something that I'm planning to go back and do solo myself. Um, so I've spent some time on on, on studying the route. It, it's fascinating. Nice. Um, so that's definitely my next uh, planned adventure. The moment the borders open up and we can prepare for that. Um in terms of Lizzie, Lizzie is phenomenal. She's a, a great ambassador for yeah. Nepal, for mountain. Um, and and out of that, obviously, very protective of the ethos of Great Himalayan Trail. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The moment you start saying you've got a record on the Great Himalayan Trail or a fastest known time, that will lead to some political discussions sure. because exactly what is the Great Himalayan Trail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've tried to be as... As, as open and specific about what we're doing right from the word go. We actually had quite a bit of correspondence with Lizzie back and forth before we even started to try it because we know that it could lead to some, mm -hmm. some confusion mm -hmm. and discussions. Um, so there was quite a bit of discussion with both Andrew and Lizzie before we went. Um, yeah. What made it quite challenging when you're in week three completely steep to steep to braft, running 1,200 Ks on the legs already. You start getting into areas of cell phone signal and the messages you get is political laden messages of what are you guys doing? Are you actually setting a record, et cetera? And, and, and that becomes really, really tricky because all yeah. you actually want to do is survive and keep going. Um, so there will always be that kind of, and I think to, to just treat that with the necessary respect because I, I, I really know where Lizzie is coming from. And even if you do try to, to be as specific as possible, um, there's a lot of interpretation out sure. there. We were very blessed with having quite a big following when we did that, um, when we did our record. And that obviously also leads to different interpretations. Um, but, yeah, we really tried to, to be specific about what we did. And even pre and post project like today to explain that there's no single Great Himalayan Trail. Um, so if you are going to go set a specific time to be very specific about what you do and how yeah. you're going to do that. Yeah, I think you were very clear. And I've, I've seen that in yeah. most of the publications. And uh, and I think you've, you've done the best that you can with the situation. And I saw sort of the different angles and stuff. And I get it. But uh, you were pretty clear. And what, what, what I really like is that you answered my next question because uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I really want to know if you might want to take on that route one day. And it's it's wonderful to hear that you're in contemplation of that yeah. route as well. We're pretty excited. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So is is there a time frame? Like, uh, you know, Nepal is open up again. Yes. So, which is great. I mean, the the poor people over there, that you know, they, they hardly get by. And there's a lot of that area they're really based on. Uh, tourism, especially over in uh, the Kumbu region. But uh, do you have a time frame set on something like this? Or is it is it still top secret? Um, no, I think uh, my original time frame was actually October this year, um, just passed. But with COVID, obviously everything upside down. Yeah. Um, I know Nepal has started opening up. But, but in terms of, there is still quite a few challenges from, from my communication with the Malayan Trail guys and Raj on that side. I actually had a trip planned for my wife and my mother. We would have gone together just hiking this year and we postponed it from April to October. And even that hasn't actually realized just purely because, of, um, yes, borders are open, but logistics around Kathmandu and mm. safety is still not, not, not quite 100%. Um, so hopefully by the end of next year um, would be the first time frame. I do believe October, November is probably a better time to do it than March we did. Um, so, yeah, I'll just keep an eye on how things develop. I've done quite a bit of work on the route. Um, yeah. So it's something that can be turned around fairly fairly quickly. Um, if I do it, I'll, I'll possibly – the idea is to do it solo and not with, with media and films and, and really just do it as a, as a personal journey, et cetera, so that people do I am, but then, then the logistics become quite a, quite a bit more challenging. Sure. Well, I'm going to recommend uh, mm-hmm. keep the gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, sure, definitely. Yeah. So... Uh, why did you choose Andrew's uh, route over Lizzie Hawker's? Um, I think we just, we know Andrew fairly well. And we know, um, like the record he set was, was at a very high level. So we wanted to, the, the whole reason for attempting an FKT for us is not to, it's not from an ego point of view to see if we can break a record. It just, if you, if you don't have an FKT to chase, it's much easier to maybe take a rest day or mm-hmm. sleep another hour longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and knowing Andrew and the level, because we had no frame of reference. I mean, it's this massive expansion mm-hmm. of a record and, and a country side to the other. So knowing Andrew and, and the high level of records he's placed and, and having had his record in the Drakensberg as my initial benchmark, that made a lot of logical sense for us. Um, because we knew that that would be something really, really challenging to chase. Mm-hmm. And also knowing that I can always go back and, and do the high route. Right. Um, the high route would also be um, a completely different type of challenge. You'll carry more gear. What we did was about 75,000 high route, slower, more climbing, uh, maybe a bit more rope work involved, which is, is more of my background, so I'll mm-hmm. really enjoy that. But it was just, we wanted to keep quite a bit of a running component to it. And we knew the combination between Andrew's high and low route would give us exposure to high passes, but also to lower rural area running. Mm. Uh, and I from a, was more from the running background of experiencing the, the country of Nepal in high mountain areas as well as lower rural areas and, and also um, you know, just experiencing the different people and the different environments in a high and a low route. So our major focus was never the record. It was to see all the different areas of a country, and Andrew's route seemed to have ticked all those boxes for us. All right. Yeah. So you've had some, you've had some really hard times on this journey. Um, uh, in the beginning, again, we talked about you were, you were navigating, and uh, you were having to pull the gloves off, and it started to affect you quite early on. Anyway, I want to pull up this clip and uh, show something here to our audience. Can you pull up clip four? Quitting is not an option, but there's so many mental things in the back of my head. It's like, actually, my, my leg is not right. And there's still a long way to go. My fingers are not quite right. and still a long way to go. So 
I think that just currently just draining me mentally as well. It's not just a physical sign. But once I've made that decision, um, it really isn't isn't an option to quit. And and that's not really linked to how many team members I have or whether it's a record or not, or whether anybody knows I'm out there. If I'm solo in the mountains and I've committed to go from point A to B, then that's what I'm gonna do. And I think it's just because I've learned and seen that whatever we do out there is really just an extension of, of, of our daily lives. And when, when you can get into the habit or the option that sometimes you're gonna push through and sometimes you're gonna quit, then, then that just translates into daily life. Wow, so crazy, man. The, the Great Himalayan Trail is a whole different monster when it comes to ultra running. And uh, you being in charge of logistics and a navigator nearly took you out. And the frostbite, how did the frostbite play out mm -hmm. over time? I'm curious because it seemed like it, it just stayed with you the whole yeah. run, even later on when things sort of warmed up. And it, I thought, but how did that play out? And did it come close to stopping your endeavor? It never came close to stopping the endeavor. Purely, as I've mentioned earlier, in terms of the like the proactive agreement you have with yourself, where you go into a project, quitting was never an option. Um, it was never even a consideration. It's when, as I mentioned earlier, is, is where to to manage the emotions side going into one of these attempts is to to really have an agreement with yourself. What are you in for and, and what are like what is your commitment? So as I've mentioned in that clip as well, is if I commit to go from point A to B, then that is it. No emotion, no injury, no nothing's going to influence that. Because the reality is when you go into sleep deprivation and you go into endurance mode over multiple days, there's so many aspects starting to convince you that it's probably a good idea to stop for the long-term health, for the risk factor. You should probably stop. Whatever happens in the project, there's going to be some time where you're going to think, you know, what the responsible thing to do is whatever, X, Y, and Z. And, and you, in my experience, you can't allow that. So I committed to run from the western side to the eastern side of the country. Even if it takes me three months, that's what I'm going to do. You don't always have control over the injuries or logistical challenges. So, But as long as you can still walk, crawl, or run, that's what I'm going to do. So it never actually came close, but it led to a whole different mental spiral because um, that happened on day four and you still had 20 plus days right. to run. So that just led to a whole different, it led to different injuries that led to a very, very dark mental space, throw a bit of sleep deprivation in there and you've really got a res like a, a, a perfect recipe for mental disaster and breakdown. Yeah, yeah it seemed wow. like it. And it, that, that seemed to stay with you for quite some time. Did yes. it? Yeah, it did, eh? Yeah, it was basically until the end of the project. I mean, some basic things. If you, if you, if you're in the mountains and you just lose the use of your hands because of cold, you can't zip up your jacket. You can't eat. You can't like the moment you lose the use of your hands. Actually, a lot of other things starts to happen, and and that's not literally just frostbite. If you if your hands are just cold. You, you actually lose the use of your tracking poles. Um, you can't, I mean, honestly, guys, you can't even eat properly. You can't dress yourself properly. So everything is effort. And when those demons start, is this worth it, etc. cetera. Um, so it's not just the, the pain of the actual frostbite. It is, am I going to lose some fingers? I'm, I basically made peace with that I'll lose at least two fingers because the quicker you make peace with that, the easier it is to move on. I, you know, one of the things that I, I learned while doing a bit of research on, on you was I, I learned about the Great Himalayan Race. Uh, what do you think about this? Does it sound like that's going to turn into something someday? Do you think this might even turn into one of the hardest ultra runs on the planet? Yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting because even in the Drakensberg, um after, after our project in the Drakensberg, the area got a, a, a lot more attention and that leads to, to various organizers contacting you asking, can they, do I think we can do it as a race? Now, the thing with a race is even, doesn't matter how extreme the race is, 
they still need to be backup. There's still insurance. There's still, and that becomes really tricky because often the only solution is it is a self-supported race. And the moment sure. they are self-supported, um, there's less um, public interest. It's more remote because you've got to find a way. The moment you, you do a race, you've got to find a way to get people involved. You've got to find a way to have people track, see some images during mm. the race. So the, yeah. the longer a race becomes... And the more remote the race becomes, the less public interest, so the less funding, and the more difficult becomes to add that protective element of if something goes wrong. Because it doesn't matter. We spoke about adventure racing earlier, and the only race I really experienced that's so remote that if something goes wrong, somebody can't get you was in Patagonia. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very dangerous for an event organizer to put on a race saying that, listen, if something goes wrong, I can't get to you. So to be honest, I've been contacted quite a few times wanting to make some of our projects into races, but mm -hmm. I've never really seen it materialize to the full extent. Either yeah. you're going to have to protect your people to an extent that you're going to feel that it's not really the Great Himalayan Trail, mm -hmm. or you're going to go so dangerous that if something goes wrong, the public risk is just too much. So sure. my experience is that the moment you want to make something a race, there's so much logistics that you actually lose the ethos and the culture that it was intended to be. So I haven't really seen it happen. It's either you're on your own, you take your own risk, or it's a race and you lose some, a little bit of that um, of that adventure element. Um, I've never really seen somebody merge those two effectively. Okay. I think, it's, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, this mountains, um, it gives us zen. And, and I think that's the very essence of the mountains. It's like it, it gives you solace. And as you said, when, once um, publicity and all this, you know, um, fundings come in, uh, the ethos and, and the serenity of uh, is defeated and you know it it basically goes away in what it should be so yeah it's yeah. interesting how you put it we learned uh, why it's not happening there's probably a lot I of other good reasons as well i mean this area uh, you know like everest and the kumbu has been has changed quite a bit because of uh tourism and i'm guessing out west it's quite different and that's probably a good thing that we keep that as well so you know it's a bit of a double-edged sword I love racing and I love expeditions and there's definitely space for both, but, but I think there are two very, very different industries or, or um, approaches. Um, so races allows us to get into areas where general public often won't get access to, but it is still within a fairly controlled environment where expeditions, um, I think, to, to bring the racing element in is where we get to the FKTs, the fastest notes. So although you do it on your own terms, you have a reference where you are in relation to whoever on it, similar to our, our project with, with, with Andrew, for instance. Um, it adds the, the, the intensity, but you're still there on your own terms and you take your own risks. Um, but both very, very important for, for developing mountains and mountain experiences, but I haven't really seen the merge between the two being that effective. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um You know, as I told you, we spoke to Rion a few weeks back, and he's done a lot of long journeys. But your, this journey for you as well is, it's a long journey, and it's done at an uh, incredible rate, and it's, it's quite different and complex. And my thought is, what's changed you inside after doing the Great Himalayan Trail experience? Do you feel like that something changed? Did you come back thinking about life differently? Did you have a different relationship with your sport definitely um but i think very different than people often think uh, so i think a lot of you learn the value of why and why you do what you do um, i've learned that most of the projects i've done actually includes a, a big portion of failure um, and it's really just what you do with that failure and how that drives you and how what you learn from that failure so I think the biggest thing I've learned from this project is you get stripped from any ego. Um, you finish after 24 days of nonstop running and you just realize that there's a bit of a hole. Um, you actually, you actually just look at things a lot more honestly and, and you, you, you face with the concept of failure. I mean, even the film that's made afterwards, like it really projects me in, in my 
weakest moment and, and, and you, you don't really like what you see. And then you realize, but that is life. Life is pretty much failure, treating it honestly, learning from it. And probably your next project is going to be another failure as long as you may be failing a little bit faster or a little bit further. So I think you, what I've learned during the, the Himalaya project is that you've got preconceived ideas of how you're going to feel and what you're going to experience through this learning experience. And I think for me is what I've learned is it's life is not about getting through the struggle. Life is struggle. And if there's not enough struggle, we'll think about something crazy to do to create struggle because that's how we grow and that's how we learn. It's not about going through a project, reaching a record and making a great year of film about it. It is us as humans develop through struggle and through failure. And that is why we think about these expeditions because life's too easy, cozy, doing a professional job. What do we do? We think about these crazy things to do. So my relationship with failure has changed where it's okay to fail. It's okay not to, to be the, but, it, but failure means things are real. We're growing and that makes us hungry to actually go and do more expeditions, even though those might be a failure as well, as long as we keep failing and keep moving and keep learning. So it's, it's just this, this complete flip of the coin where you think you're going to come out like, hey, I've reached the record. And you actually you honestly don't care about the record. You're just so raw and so honest with yourself because you've spent time in a pretty dark place for 24 days. And you get addicted to that feeling of realness because very little of what we do, maybe with the exception of what you guys do sailing around the world, but a lot of what we do in modern life is actually just plastic so failure represents for me the realness of the challenges we take. So, yes, I learned a lot about myself. And I think the biggest thing is just to be okay with the concept of failure because it means that you were in the, in the arena, busy fighting, learning, growing. And, and that's a big part of why I go, want to go back to Nepal and do the high route because there's, there's a lot more that, that I would want to experience. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Very deep and very profound. Definitely. I want to <laughs> keep, us, keep us filled in on that next adventure for sure. Yeah. But. So, right now, um, as a navigator, um, was it difficult for you to keep uh, on the right route? We were lucky that we, the navigation went really well. It was really, really challenging. It went well, I guess, based on a bit of experience and, and a lot of pre-homework that we did. Um, what was really challenging is that the routes that I saw, saw on Google Earth that I wanted to take, when you get there, it's all snowed in. So there is no route. There's no obvious way to go. I know I'm on the right reach. I know where I'm supposed to go. But it was just so crazy slow because you're either waist deep or knee deep in, in the snow. So... The frustration wasn't, I knew that we were on the right route. The frustration came in when you realized that at home you plan to do 60 or 100 Ks today and you end up on 25. And those calculations, so it wasn't the direction that was, that was really thrown out. It was, the, it was just adjusting to, to basically um, the pace at which we moved. And the escalating effect of that was the effect on the permits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So navigating is not just about going the right direction. It's everything around it. So from a filming point of view, we would have seen the film crew maybe three or four times over the whole route, which involved them flying in with the helicopter or people flying with small planes to bring us our permits. And the moment you do a quarter of the distance you thought you're going to do in a day, the escalating effect of that over 24 days is insane. Um, so it was very frustrating. Um, moving that slow, we literally crawl through snow where you planned on actually running on a on a trail for the day because you were looking forward to this day because on Google Earth you could see there's an actual trail going in the right direction. You get there and you're just crawling in the snow. Um, and that just tested obviously your 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 sense of humor, your mental fortitude, um, and your teamwork. Um, so direction all went well, but but the pacing got thrown out the window with the weather. Yeah, I bet that was hard mentally, especially when you were in charge of logistics. You're like, hey, I didn't see the snow on that Google map. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, For one sure. of the other things I, I kept sure. keep thinking about was, you know, one of the last times Janet and I were there, we we did a trek unsupported from Jerry uh, up through the Kumbu region to uh, anyway up towards 
Lukala, and, or I'm sorry, past Lukala, all the way up to Everest Base Camp. But anyway, we, we trekked from Jury, which is the lower altitudes. And what I found in the lower altitudes and lower regions was that a lot of the valleys came in, like we had to cross valleys and other valleys sort of segued in. And I found that we really did a lot of, uh, a lot of ascents and descents far more than we did when the when we got up to altitude and i found that actually the lower altitude physically was more trying because of that uh the way the terrain was it, it okay altitude wasn't an issue but it was the really extreme all the way down to the deep river beds all the way up to the summits and down really a lot of extremes i found at lower altitudes can you tell us a little bit about the train and the physical difficulties on the route? Did you find this? Or? Yeah. Definitely. It, for me personally, I function better in cold. Um, so the lower altitudes were a lot harder. Yeah. And then that also coupled with um, we had to make up a lot of time in the lower altitudes because we moved so slow in the in the snow area. So, and unfortunately, about a about five days after I got the frostbite, I tore the muscle that connected my quad into my knee, which left me with a very swollen leg. Um, so when you had to run like 100 k's a day in, in the low altitudes with, with quite a busted knee, um, hands that don't really work well, and you've got to try to make up the time, and it's super hot and humid in the lower areas, I found that really, really tough. Um, in the higher areas, when you're injured, it's okay because you're moving slow in any case, but now you've got to make up time in the lower areas. And also in the higher areas, you almost have an excuse to take a break for a couple of hours through the night because of the, the cold and the temperatures. But going lower down, we often only slept 20 minutes or half an hour in a 24-hour cycle to, to really try to make up the time to make the record because we were so far behind initially that we, we had to make up because that. Towards the eastern side, the second half of the map, we were lowered down for big portions. And then you just you don't have no excuse. You've just got to keep on running um, with obviously quite a few of the challenges that came with that. So I personally found the lower areas a lot harder, where Ryan is used to more warmer temperatures. So he found the high is harder, and we just kind of complemented each other. Right. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when Todd said, like, it's uh, up and down and up and down, I think, you, you know the Nepali flats. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> yeah, the Nepali flat. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they call it. <laughs> so, so which parts of your equipment proved to be the most valuable during this difficult mission? Maybe I should start with what equipment we we really missed. Um, I come from a mountaineering background, so it would have been <laughs> the easiest thing to take super lightweight ice axes and crampons. In hindsight, it would have been awesome, but we didn't because we wanted to go as light as possible. And we were told during this time of year, the route, because even the passes that we did cross, we'd have some snow, but we'll get, we'll get past it <laughs> yeah. without, without any ice equipment. So that's one thing that we really missed. Um, what was very valuable um, was uh, our down jackets. We actually ran in, in down jackets because of the cold. Uh, shell jackets and then the gloves if you don't take them off they work really well so um some proper waterproof gloves down jacket shell jacket work really well um for the rest we actually ran in shorts a lot of the time short uh, and and normal trail running shoes so but our shell and down jackets is, is what kept us really going in the life because we had no form of shelter no tent or anything with us the warmest we had was one down jacket one shell jacket and a thermal top that was the extent of, of our protection in the high mountains. Wow. Extreme. <laughs> That's amazing. So how did you manage to minimize the equipment you carried with you on a daily basis? How, how heavy was your standard kit, so to speak? So we only took 20 liter backpacks. So whatever didn't fit in the 20 liter backpack, that didn't go with. Um, and then basically that consisted of, of, Waterproof gloves, thermal top, down jacket, shell jacket, maybe some warmer headgear, and one waterproof pants um, if if needed, um, and that was basically it in terms of in terms of clothing. We had a power bank, especially when we had cell phone signal in the second half. We had a power bank. We what we carried that was super useful, um, and I actually forgot about it there for a second. Is 
um, what we call a scary pen, an ultraviolet light pen that we could um, purify oh, the water yeah, with. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that proved very, very helpful. Um, we, we could get water in the mountains, through the villages, but purifying that um, really helped us so we didn't carry too much water. And that pretty much filled our backpack. And then, especially in the first half of the map, we the only food we could get was dalbat, which we really learned to love. Um, but we would literally, if we got food, we would fill a Ziploc with two liters of rice and we just strap it on the outside of our packs. <laughs> so all the food basically got strapped on the outside and the clothing was on the inside. And then we would just eat out of the Ziploc. We would eat our rice until we find more food a day or two later. So you had Dalbat power. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> What's, that is a we song had. or a, something about Dalbot power. I can't remember it. No, it's, we love Dalbot. Yeah, they're really, really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get a little tired at the end of the trip. But, anyways, d- that was one of the things I was curious about your diet. You're, you're burning a heck of a lot of calories every day. And how adequate was Dalbot for you? Was it, was it your main meal the whole trip? And did you take any supplements? Did you did you take any vitamins? What were they, if you did? So on the night, um, it was our only meal and main meal for the first half of the map. And then you move towards the eastern side of the map and suddenly you go lower um, because of the route we followed and we went through a lot more villages and now you've got access to chocolates and biscuits, <laughs> coconut biscuits, and, and naturally, we bought that because that's a lot quicker sugar, a quicker energy. But in hindsight, if I go back, that's the biggest lesson I've learned is I will start and finish with dull butt. I'll stay away from any sugars or any artificial food, although normally in advanced racing, that's fine because you race five to eight days. But if you're going to run for 24 days, I will stick to rice and vegetables the whole way. Yeah. Mm. Because towards work three, we our, our stomachs were so upset. We like it just didn't work. Our systems couldn't handle sugar anymore. So in hindsight, dull butt, definitely dull butt power is the way to go <laughs> in your bowl. So that's the one massive change I would make and even change my diet beforehand to have my body a lot sure. more adapted to that kind of, of, of vegetables. And I'll, I'll stick to that the whole way and water. Um, what we did is, is we still had all butt in the second half, but we supplemented it with a lot more biscuits. Because if you've been running through the night, you get to a village and you can buy chocolates. You just buy chocolates and eat it. But in hindsight, that's the worst thing we could have done. Um, and the lesson hard learned, we won't do that again. In terms of supplements, we drank some basic multivitamins, um, which we drink at home. We didn't change anything there. Um, and for the rest, we didn't take anything in terms of uh, energy bars or gels or anything. We, we really wanted to keep it. Part of the challenge was to find our food in the villages. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had some very basic um, uh, nutrition we would pick up as part of our backup equipment. So how our equipment or backup worked, we had three bags, 300-liter bags, which I then, through an adventure racing approach, worked out that we'll see those three bags five times, meaning bag one, I'll come back. Two, I'll see the second and the fifth time. And the third back, I'll see right in the middle. So we had three bags that would rotate as the porters would take them along the route. And there would be some backup shoes, backup clothing, and some very, very basic nutrition. But the biggest part of the challenge was to find our nutrition through that um, at the villages and from local people. Right. I can imagine. Yeah. So... I uh, I, I really love the pep, that one of the things when we're, we're in... Nepal and in the Himalayas, I really enjoy the people. I love the people there. They're so gracious. They're totally in touch with nature. They're almost in symbiosis with the land. You know, it's it's incredible feeling to be there and and be part of them in their communities. How did the locals treat you from east to west? You know, you've got the difference uh, of there's a little bit of different in the culture from west to east. Uh, the Hindu. In the, in the East and the Buddhists in the West. Did you find there was any difference there in hospitality? And how were you received along the way? We were received awesomely right throughout the country. Um, the Nepali people, one, if it was them, we would have died in those mountains, no doubt. Um, literally, we would go through the Dolpha area, 
because of the winter, we were the first people through the passes. So there were literally nobody in the Dolpha area. Mm. We would go for like two days, three o'clock in the morning, get to the small monastery. Wow. There's not supposed to be anybody in there. Still took a chance, knocked and for a while, waited for a while. And then we would get a monk opening the door and allowing us in. We couldn't speak any, they couldn't understand English. We obviously can't speak Nepali. So, but that person would let us in and just give us some warmth, give us rice, um, so one, the fact that they open the doors for us, um, they would make us food. And you can, you can see that they've been in those environments through the winter. They have very little food. They would sometimes just make you basic rice. They don't have any vegetables left. But you can clearly see that whatever they have, they give you. Um, we would have instances where we'd pitch up in a, in a village, 3 o'clock in the morning, knock on the door. People would come out open for us, seeing that we were in really bad shape. And they would climb out of their beds and let us climb into their warm beds. And wow. which, it was a bit awkward. They would stand at you while you sleep. You open your eyes and they stand there, look at you, three o'clock, four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. But literally just to check if you're still okay. Um, and, and if you're in that desperate like state and, and position, you don't care. You just like normally would say, no, 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 I can't sleep in your bed. You know, um, you must sleep in your bed. I'll sleep on the floor. But literally they would get up get the kids out of their beds and you would climb in a warm bed um, and they would stand there or maybe start making food for you. Mm -hmm. So honestly, right throughout the Nepali people, they are the reason why we were, why stupid two guys running across the country <laughs> with minimal gear made it through a life. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did, we did experience a change in, for instance, how they, uh, the Nepali people dressed, and how the dialect, et cetera, towards the eastern side of the map, they were a lot more used to Western exposure because of the more commercial areas, like the Dolpha area, a lot more uh, or, or very, very different. But in terms of acceptance and friendliness, right throughout the country was phenomenal. Yeah, Excellent. we agree. We agree. Yeah, we experience uh, the same hospitality as well. But I, I'm also thinking that part of this is the the extreme environments they live in that over thousands of years they've sort of worked with all the all the people that they have to receive or comes through the community they probably have to treat there's a there's a teamwork about being a community at that level of environment where you really need to care for the person who comes across the land across the trail because they really need you that we all work together i think that's that's developed over time yeah definitely so what did the, you take away from the culture and spirit of the people with whom you spent a month in the outposts of Nepal? Always be kind. Yeah. That's the, always be kind. <laughs> you got no idea the journey the other person is on. You might never see that person again, but your simple act of kindness could save somebody's life without you knowing it. And it doesn't matter if you ever know it. Those people in your poll that, that, that open their doors for us, um, we might never see them again. We might never meet them again. But if they didn't open their doors, we would have died in those mountains. We were ill-prepared. Um, they had more than enough justification to say, sorry, I can't give you food. I, only ha I don't have my own food. The winter is late. So just the simple act of kindness without expecting any reward. Um, uh, when we spoke to the Nepali people, they don't even have the frame of reference. Why would anybody run across the country? Yeah, <laughs> what's this guy doing? For, the, for them, it's survival. For me, it's it's a fun activity. It's like I have such a, like uh, my life is so well that I can think of stupid adventures to go on. And for that, the Pali people, life is an adventure. They don't have the luxury to think of, I'm going to go to another country for two months and run somewhere. And Despite so, what I've learned is always be kind, even though you don't understand, and even though you, you might never get something back. Your act of kindness always goes a lot further than than you can ever realize. And the fact that they were kind allows me to be kind to the next person. Um, in the Western world, we're so busy, we're so um, involved in our own journeys that honestly, even something as I might think it's great to run across the country. It's still very plastic. It's still not real life. Real life is what they experience in those mountains, getting up every morning for survival. And even despite that journey of survival, they are still make time to, to help me when I do something stupid. 
And if I can pass that on, the world will be a lot better place. So that's the one thing I took from from the Nepali people. That's very, that's very great. inspiring, you and know. It's great. Well put, well said, and wonderful lesson learned. And uh, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I definitely make some gains from that as well. Thank you. Um, you know, so frost, you had frostbite. And was one of the it was one of the many challenges that you faced along the way. And, but you know, one of the things that I remember is that somewhere around the end of your run, it seemed like something happened. I'm not quite sure. Like, it, did you did the body just completely give out? Uh, it almost seemed as though you might have suffered a heart attack or something was definitely sus. Your system was shutting down. How did you get through that dark hour? What happened? How did you pull up from the episode? And then how did you get on to finish? So it all kind of started with the frostbite um, purely because of not just the physical challenges, but it, it starts a mental spiral, which you're fighting against your own head the whole time. Because the one thing you're fighting against is you should have known better. Um, I'm in mountaineering training. That's what I do. You should have known better. And then you remind yourself, but if I didn't do it, we probably would have died in there because I couldn't use my hands and I had to make a plan. But you still have this internal internal dialogue the whole time. And, and as I've mentioned earlier, that dialogue actually determines your whole world. How you talk to yourself and how you break yourself down or build yourself up will determine a lot of your success going forward. But then as luck would have had it, because of that, like, that internal journey plus the sleep deprivation navigation ties your body out. And at some stage, I just misstepped and I tore the muscle that connects my quad into my knee. And the pain of that plus the pain of your hands, because the pain in my knee was so bad I couldn't walk. So I developed a strategy where if you keep running through the pain, and it, it was quite painful, but if you run through the pain enough, your body reacts by producing and excess fluid yeah okay and 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 and, and you literally your, your knees swell up to a point where it creates an actual brace so if you can run in extreme pain for two three hours you will then gather enough fluid that your your leg actually becomes stiff from the fluid now you can run with with your like stiff hands and stiff legs you can run 100 cats <laughs> and if you do that continuous every day the pain just builds up because it becomes more and more difficult to do it um, so you've got these mental hacks of if you can just get through enough pain for two, three hours, then you it will get better. Um, your leg will swell enough that you can kind of hobble along. Now you hobble along with sore hands, sore legs, day in, day out. But when you wake up after a power nap, just getting dressed and getting your tights over your, your swollen leg is quite difficult. So now you've got you've got a leg that's quite big and you've got tights that's quite small, but you can't pull it. You can't pull your tights over your leg because your hands don't work. Yeah. So that's your first 20 minutes in the day is how do I actually get dressed? You know, how do I, how do I even do this? And if you do that long enough, you've got this internal battle. And then externally, um, I had Ryan talking to me the whole time, wanting me to quit, not because of any negative influence, but he could see what I was going through. And I had the external factor of the filming guys telling me, listen, we've got to get you to a village. You're going to lose your fingers. Um, we've got to get you to a clinic. So you just fight because I committed. I'm not going to quit, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the internal narrative led to my body shutting down because of the pain and because of just this lot of voices. And yeah. then remember, yeah. when sleep deprivation comes in, the voices actually accumulate. So now you don't know who's talking to who. Your head's completely like, like your head's just like upside down. You don't know what's going on. Um, and then at some stage, the body just said, listen, to protect whatever's going on, I'm going to shut down um, because it's just not worth it to keep going because of the pain, because of the mental challenge. So even though I just kept moving, my body just shut down and I passed out. Um, but luckily, I could sleep for about four hours, got up and just kept moving. Um, and what the movie doesn't show is when I got up there, I still had 500 Ks to go. Um, so it wasn't like you were just around the corner. So after that final, like breaking down kind of heart attack, I had the last 500 Ks to, to kind of hobble along. Well, you know, it, it might be my age, you know, I probably got, I'm not, I'm quite a bit older, but I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I say that a couple of weeks ago, you know, I've, I, 
I've been doing, I started up my runs, I've been out running, but something happened. I, I started having an ankle thing, and, you know, I just ignored it a bit, and, and then I got <laughs> up the next day, and I sort of doubled my distance. <laughs> and I came home the next, the next morning, two days later, I, I couldn't walk, and I still, yeah. this is three weeks later, and I, you probably know what this is, it's, um, it's a tendonitis ankle injury. It's on the inside of your ankle. And if you if you don't treat it right, you if you keep running through it, you could actually cause damage, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm reading. Uh, long-term damage in your, your arch support will fall away eventually. So I've had to lay off running for a few weeks <laughs> now, and it's really made me feel quite old. <laughs> but... Yeah, but but the the, the, the determination so I, is there. But I, I think that's what happened on that second day when I I, went, I doubled my distance because you, you do get to that threshold. It's like all of a sudden there is a, a point where the pain goes away. And obviously mine was a bit different. I'm probably just running on endorphins and not that uh, process that you're talking about. But I, I think that I caused a bit of damage. I should have probably taken the day off. But yeah, I th- I think this is this is one one thing that. Uh, is always take it for granted is the rest you know like training exerting effort um is also equiv- rest is also is, is equally important as exerting effort so i think uh, most athletes you know they they go they get burned out because they they don't they take for granted the rest part and that's is really important so i think what happened to you you said that it shut down but after you had four to five hours sleep, you just rejuvenated. You know, you're just like, pew, like a new whole engine. So you're I the think man. <laughs> <laughs> Superman. <laughs> so understanding the environment, right now, how essential it is to have a partner on yeah. the Great Himalayan Trail. How important is a teammate? Understanding between the two of you for success in an attempt on something as grandiose and extreme as this. It's absolutely crucial and even more important is the right partner. Um, I think you don't want to get to know each other on a trip like to know each other before you go into a trip. Brian and I have spent some good and dark times together before this trip um, and we knew each other. We spent four years together before we went in more project since we did the Drakensberg project. Um, and it just as you've mentioned earlier, is like Ryan is the most patient guy out there. Like he can run 10 times faster than I do and he's a world-class endurance athlete. And and just how he supported me. Um, and interestingly, during this project, I didn't want to quit because of him and he wanted me to quit because of, <laughs> but because of me. He wanted the best for me and I wanted the best for him. So it was just this really, and then we got to a point where, listen, the best way to get out of this is to finish as quick as possible. And that's why that last week, we just did, did like 100 plus K days just the whole time to, to just, okay, we're not going to quit. So to minimize damage, we're just literally going to move as quick as possible. And obviously for him, that was quite slow. He's just absolutely phenomenal when it comes to running. So to to have that partner that can support you, if he doesn't agree, um, he, he, he would rather suggest me quitting because of the long-term damage but he still respects my decision, supports me in that. And and so your yeah, partner, extremely important, but also having a partner that that you get along with well, that you know well, and you know both the good and the bad side of each other and, and really just have the best intentions for each other is, is so, so crucial. Um, and something I'm very, very grateful for because, as I've mentioned, he's just my absolute role model as well. So to be able to have learned from him and go through this, this project together um, and I think the biggest test is being friends afterwards. Yeah, um, a project yeah. like this can make or break sure. any relationship. Yep. And, and your biggest your biggest celebration is to get out of this, take the good and the bad, but still preserve the relationship. I think that's the ultimate test of any expedition. Yeah. Yes. I totally get it. Um, uh, at being on a boat and taking mm-hmm. on crew, being at sea, the sea changes you quite a bit. You're not the same person. Yes. The same thing when you put yourself into hard, extreme environments, and you learn about uh, yeah. your your friends, and so the true colors come out. Yeah, so you know, we know, <laughs> we know, <laughs> and you have to deal with it. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. So you you managed a lot of exhausting efforts. You encountered a lot of dangers on the great Himalayan trail just to succeed. What attracts you to uh, fastest known times and what makes them different? Um, fastest known times just make the expedition real. It, it, it adds an intensity, similar to adventure racing, it adds an intensity that, that really amplifies the learning experience. Because I, I, quitting was never an option. But if there wasn't an FKT, I probably would have justified that with the frostbite or with the knee injury to rather do it over 30 days. Yeah. Because there was there was no benchmark, there's no intensity. Mm. And I would have still go, came out of there and say, great job, you know. But the FKT just keep pushing you into that life intensified moment into to keep on moving, to sleep for 20 minutes as opposed to two hours. It's the momentum and it keeps it real. Um because it provides a benchmark of, of that relentless forward motion. Yeah, so my, my question uh, is, I think, quite related to that. So when you attempt a project like this, Great Himalayan Trail, do you run for the time or for the experience? I think you run for the time and the experience is the result of it. Um, because you got no control over the experience. The experience would be determined by external factors, it would be determined how you feel. But if you act on external factors and if you act on how you feel, then you also alter the experience where if you focused on the time, hell or high water, that's what you've got to do. Or at least give your best and trying to get as close as possible to that record. And, and that leads to a more authentic experience. We, we live in a world, a lot of the experiences we create for ourselves is very plastic, it's very... It's very artificial where if you run for the time, you take the experience, good and bad, and you learn from both. Yeah. Yeah. It's really and good. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Now that you've gained that experience, what would you tell someone who is attempting the fastest known time on the Great Hemlin of the here in the future? What, what would you say, what, what would take away to help them? Firstly, don't overthink it. Go. I think uh, uh, there's so many great ideas, adventures, and dreams out there that people never get to do because they overthink it. You'll never be ready. You'll never be fit enough. You'll never be prepared enough. Um, and even the ones that don't go according to plan are still worth it. Uh, a project that's a complete failure is still worth more than the one you're thinking about and never getting to. Um, as humans, we've got this innate longing for and dreaming of adventure and per definition adventure is is something where the outcome is probably not what you thought it's going to be and you've got to deal with it that is adventure so if you want to go on an adventure and you want to plan everything to tea then it's not an adventure it, it, so yes prepare as well as you can within your confinements but the reality is i spent five percent of my day on sport and adventure most of my day is in the corporate world and investing in people so I have all the reason in the world to not do expeditions because I don't have time to prepare. But the reality is if you don't do it, you're never going to go through that experience. So the first thing is whether it's a great Himalayan trail or whether it's a run in your back mountains, don't overthink it. Commit and just do it. You can rather learn and fail and do another one as opposed to waiting your whole life looking back and be regretful of I didn't actually take the plunge. Um, so... And then not to be, once you're on the adventure, not to be so stuck on what you thought is going to be the outcome that you actually have this bad internal narrative with, your, with yourself the whole time. So take the whole experience, good and bad. Learn and grow through it. Um, one thing is that, and, and in the Himalayan Trail as well, is, is that when things go bad, it's quite difficult to sing to yourself and force yourself to be in the moment. Because the moment things go wrong, you so want to get out of the adventure and so past and you can't wait for it to be finished that you're actually never present. You can keep moving, but your head can already be at home. So I would say, don't overthink it. Know that things are going to go wrong by default. Things are going to go wrong in every expedition, but force yourself to be present in that moment so you can learn and grow through it. What people often do is, is that they wait so long to go on an adventure. And even if they do go on an adventure, 
you're so upset and so like disappointed when things go wrong that you actually mentally remove yourself from this expedition already. And then afterwards you want to look back and say, what did I learn? It's way more powerful to learn while you're in it. We didn't speak to each other for almost eight months. Yeah, it's a little bit of contact, but we never spoke about the expedition afterwards because that's how long it took us to process because we were real, we were present, and that therefore it took a long time. If you're never pro- if you're never present, it's very easy to move on. But if you're actually in the expedition, that's when you learn the most and the hardest, but it's worth it. So two things, don't overthink it. And when you're there, be present and learn what you need to learn. It's not about the record. It's not about the time. It's about what you're learning during the project. Um, it's the hardest way, but it's definitely the best way to do it in my opinion. Wow. Right on. Great advice. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you know, you see it so many uh, things in life as well yeah. where that rule applies and many of us get caught up in our dreams, but don't go out and pursue them. Yes. And um, so thank you for that. Thinking and planning. You know, a lot of people are always just thinking and planning, but they get stuck making there. it yeah. happen is like totally different issue <laughs> so they are totally different things so I, I think Rion one of Rion's uh, themes or uh, taglines is there's an ocean between saying and doing right it's true so <laughs> thanks for that yeah. yeah what an incredible journey you wow. and Ryan had through the uh, Himalayas pretty profound uh, mm. I want to congratulate you both it, it's inspired me. It's a. I also want to tell people to uh, check out the the Red Bull documentary on uh, on Lessons from the Edge. It's awesome, man. That yeah. is one cool film. Very inspiring. So uh, people should get out and watch Thank that. Thank you for very sure. much. Yeah, you guys did a great job. What a great, inspiring journey. So thank you. Thanks for all that information and giving us some beta. It'll be quite easier or a lot easier for Janet and I now when we when we yeah. do our great Himalayan trek. <laughs> <laughs> we learned from uh, from somebody who really has done it. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks so much, guys. Yeah, man. Uh, some of the things I'm curious about you've talked about you you've touched on a little bit here are some of the things that you're doing now in the corporate world. And, you know, I've seen uh, the website Gravity Works. I've checked that out. It looks pretty high-tech, cool stuff. What are you doing when you're talking about investing in people? Give us a little bit about that life and, and where, you're, where you're putting your time now. So I'm quite involved in various commercial avenues. Um, one of them are the Gravity Group, which is a group that um, specializes in training people that work at height. Um, it really comes from a mountaineering background, but people that work commercially on buildings, towers, rescue teams all over the world, telecommunication companies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a business a friend and I started about 20 years ago, and that's really grown nicely over the years. And we've got quite a few um, locations all over the world. With that, we've got another company that go out and do the actual specialist work, which is which is higher risk and higher higher um, level work. Mm-hmm. And we also manufacture um, all over the world. We manufacture some of the harnesses and the and the safety equipment that people oh. use to work on these um, in these various areas at height. But for us, it's always been about investing in and developing people towards a common goal. Um, so we, we focus a lot on, firstly, I'm a Christian and from a Christian background, we, we focus really on how to develop and grow relationships and allow people to grow in a business, giving them a career, giving them career opportunities all over the world. And for us, it's really about how we treat each other and how we treat all the various stakeholders in our business. So for us, having a profitable business is the bare minimum for us to be a purpose is we have a dream that anybody that we encounter will have a change in their course of direction. Where if I encounter you from a business point of view, I want to leave you thinking, why are we doing business in a certain way? From an integrity point of view, from a relationship, from a communication point of view, my background is I always wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to preach and I want to change people's lives Mm -hmm. and I was challenged to do that through business because people spend 80% of their lives 
in business and interacting in a business and corporate world. Right. And, and I've got a massive passion to use business, not just the financial side, but the vehicle side to help and teach people that you can still have a successful and profitable business, but act with integrity, develop people, treat people fairly, and have a bigger purpose and a bigger message of we live once, how we treat each other and how we help each other is ultimately the goal. So whether I work in business, whether I work in expeditions, whether I work with my sponsors, the one line and one theme is the same, and that is we live once, let's build each other up for a better world. And, and I find that because of the often negative connotation to corporate business, I've taken on the challenge with, with a whole bunch of really, really special people to, as a minimum, have a very successful international business that's profitable, that's changing people's lives for the better, and then use that as a credible way to hopefully leave a legacy where we treated each other in a way where we've built each other up We've built relationships and, and we've acted in integrity because money in general has got such a negative connotation in the world. And we often find people going on expeditions because they want to get away from the commercial side of the world. Mm, yeah. I've taken on the challenge to rather change the commercial side of the world that we don't need to run and hide to the mountains, that the running of the hiding in the mountains are just an extension of being in nature as opposed to having a five-day corporate life and then hating that and then having a weekend. Yeah. So I really try to what I learn in expeditions bring back into the business, and that is life is real, life is often tough, but how we treat each other, how kind we are to each other can ultimately change the trajectory of how we see and experience business. In, in, in short, you have mom and dad working at the office and everything they experience at the office eventually leads back to home. How they treat their children, how they educate their children is very much influenced by how they are treated in a corporate environment. And I've got this massive mm. dream wow. to change that. And, and therefore, whether I run in the mountains or whether I run corporate business, it, for me, it's the same adventure, is have a goal and include a strong team and treat each other with kindness. And through that, we can change the world. That's, but that's very easy to do that with a nonprofit organization because profit is not the goal. But to have a really successful, profitable business and still choose people as the main focus, mm -hmm. that is for me a personal challenge and those people that I work with on a, on a global scale. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's well said. Um, I'm curious, is, is this... Is this gravity groups when you talk about this? Is this uh, is it part of the policy or is it a consulting agency to sort of bring into businesses where you sort of talk about these ideas and policies, so to speak? So firstly, I keep myself way too busy. Um, so I do a lot of consulting. Um, I specialize in international tax and business restructuring. That's, that's, that's the biggest part of what I do. But then I also a co-owner of the Gravity Group, which has got outlets in five African countries. Um, and we've just recently opened in Australia. We're present in South America and in Europe. And so I'm also a co-shareholder there. Um, and then I do similar work with all my sponsors. Um, and I do quite a bit of corporate speaking. So wherever I'm involved in a corporate environment, that is the ethos and the culture that, that I try to to reinforce and bring to the table. I've been fortunate to be involved in the building up of the Gravity Group, um, which does this work at the high training, and that's, that's integrated in the DNA of our culture. That is how we do business. And, and that makes it a lot easier. So in the Gravity Group, that is how we do business. When I work with other businesses from a consulting point of view, I'm challenging businesses to do things differently. Okay. Not just from a sustainability point of view, um, that's also very important, but how we treat our people and how we build people up. Mm -hmm. Business typically is often at the cost of people. Right. I make money at the cost of my employees. I make money at the cost of the environment. I believe there's, there's a really, really um, great opportunity for businesses through people and through the world and through sustainability as opposed to have these opposing concepts. And, and, and that is really what drives me um, and the relationships behind it. 
Um, and that's similar to my projects. Um, that's why I haven't really done solo projects to date because I enjoy the relationships being built through these projects. Um, so yeah, corporate business adventure, all really one theme. And that is how we treat each other ultimately determines the success and, and our experience while we only live once. A lot from that. So, yeah. so looking ahead, do you have any big um, projects in the making? Anything new on the horizon? Uh, Besides the, okay, you got the Great so Himalayan Trail next year. Yeah. But that's, is that the one that you're shooting for next? Really? The big, the big. That, that would definitely be my, my next uh, personal or mm. solo project. Yeah. Um, then there's always projects that Ryan and I are working on. Um, we would have been uh, in Namibia actually at the moment, um, just north of South Africa. We would have been there. Um, on a very beautiful stretch of coast, the Skeleton Coast in mm -hmm. the northern part of Namibia. But unfortunately, with COVID and permits, we mm -hmm. uh, the project got pulled very last minute, like three or four days before we left. Um, we are looking at some local mountain projects. We've got a, the country inside South Africa where the Drakensberg is, um, is called Lesotho. And we, we're actually looking at uh, some other projects in Lesotho, maybe running around Lesotho, which would include the Drakensberg as well as some other high mountain areas. Um, but I think for me in Nepal, there's, there's some unfinished business there, not from an ego or record point of view, but in terms of reconnecting mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of, of myself that I left there. And, and until I've done that, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be restless. I'll, I think there's, there's a lot more that I want to and can learn there. Um, and I think that's why I also want to do it without filming, without team members and really just go and reconnect. It's almost that... There's, there's, there were some gaps opened. There were some learning opened, but it's not quite ticked off yet. And, and I want to really go back there before, um, before I take on too many other big challenges, just in terms of closing that circle. Um, there were so many emotions in that project. So I'll feel more at rest once I've done the, the Nepal solar project and then looking for other big projects. But in terms of smaller ones, um, Running around Lesotho will probably be about 950 kilometers, um, but it's more local. It's it's more controlled. So, uh, but yeah, the big one would be would be Nepal. That's where, where my heart is at the moment. Cool. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. You mentioned your wife a while ago, and I I believe that she is really a big supporter of of what you're doing. <laughs> She must be. <laughs> is she is she quite similar to you? Is she, does she get out? Um, she's definitely the most patient person in the world, um, and really supports me in what I do. Uh, because especially with the planning and the preparation, things get really hectic trying to balance life and 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 projects and mapping and 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 it's actually. I think all of us know as adventurers or expeditionists, it's it's very selfish. Um, so firstly, from a support and patience point of view, uh, my wife, Angela, is phenomenal. And then she loves the outdoors, um, and we do quite a bit of cycling together. We do some running together. She prefers not to, to be too competitive. She, she really enjoys the experience of, of, of riding and running, although she, she does it, I think, more active than I do most mm -hmm. days. Um, so this morning, we actually went for a cycle together, and then we went for a bit of running um, so it's just awesome to experience that together. But when it comes to the big expeditions, um, she is, I mean, in terms of running around and buying equipment and preparing food lists, and, and, and she's such a crucial part of that team. So patience, logistics, um, she's really, really switched on the spreadsheets and making sure all the dots are ticked. So, and that's really the one aspect that allowed me to have a corporate life as well as to expeditions, because if I if I had to do all the preparation myself, it, it would be humanly impossible. Oh, yeah. So patience and, and logistic support is, is is really crucial and and something I'm extremely grateful for. That's great to hear. Add Angela, add a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Reno. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. I think we're, we're going to wrap it up. We're running out of time, but I want to say a few last things. I want to say, one, you're an amazing human being, and yes. I feel so privileged to meet you. And thank you for sharing so much of your uh, experience and your knowledge with us. 
thank you very much. And hopefully one day you can join us again. We can do a follow up and on, on another adventure down the line. So stay in touch with us. Stay in touch with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rainy. As it, it as I said a while ago, it, when you accepted our invitation, we were really very excited. Todd and I can't stop talking about you and all the questions and all the things that we want to learn from you and. We're really excited to meet you, and uh, thank you. We know you're a busy person, but thank you for your valuable time that you shared with us tonight. Super fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Todd and Janet. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to that catch-up. Yeah. Um, I've studied your website. You guys are doing some crazy adventures. <laughs> so I think next time I'll be asking the questions and interviewing you guys. Keep up the great work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, it, it would be a real nice time. Maybe we'll uh, join each other and uh, catch up in the mountains one day. It'd be really cool. So let's stay in touch. Good luck yeah. with everything and uh, with the future. We're doing. We're going through some uh, definitely some different times, challenging times. Yeah. And you're someone that can be a leader and help all of us through. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it.